Hi folks, this is Jason. Hope you're okay today. We're looking at this book, uh, Christianity and a History of Christianity by Dr. McCulloch. He writes on page 215 about Nicaea to Chalcedon. Arius himself faded from public life and although pardoned by Constantine, eventually died obscurely, reputedly as the result of an acute attack of dysentery in Latrine in Constantinople, which circumstance it afforded his enemies some Christian pleasure and was eventually commemorated with an exemplary lack of charity in the Orthodox liturgy. He had tried to exercise the sort of independence of mind and as a teacher which had been possible in the Alexandrian of Origins day, but which was becoming dangerous in an age which, when bishops were seeking to monopolize control of instruction, nevertheless he had raised questions which would not go away. There were problems with the word homousius, the homousian, to begin with, and most troubling, it was not a word used in the Bible. Second, it had history, which we have already touched on when discussing the monarchy and, monarchy and disputes. Arius had asserted to his bishop that he'd expressed the views of the hated Manichaeans about Christ's nature. It is likely that his known detestion of the term was a major factor in dragging it into the new creed. Likewise, for Eusebius of Nicomedia, it was a word tainted by the likes of Paul of Samosta, and he spurred not, no effort to place like-minded bishops in positions of power over the next decades. The campaign to get rid of the homosusium from Christian creedal statements split the church in the empire for another half century and more. Now, what I find interesting here is he spends more time talking about Arius really than he does I think about Irenaeus, uh, Athanasius really um, hmm. yeah I think um, if you read the history of uh, the theological debates um, that were surrounding um, that were coming up to the Council of Nicaea and then during the Council of Nicaea and after it's a very very complex history um, and you can't capture that history within a couple of pages like the colour here even though this is a massive history it's a general survey really and you can't really even begin to get into that history without really getting into the source material yourself. Um, so his explanations are simplistic because the actual complexity and the richness of that history cannot be computed in just a couple of pages. Uh, I think the, the historian here is on dangerous ground when he's talking about uh, theological language and some of the theological language that the, the specifically here in this case the orthodox are using is not quite cutting mustard um, I think you're on dangerous ground from a theological perspective to say that um, you need to explain how you're not being biased by saying that and I don't think he does make it clear why he thinks he's not biased in making a statement like that so if you're going to make a theological statement about theological language you better be in a position to explain where you're coming from on that issue and I don't think he does as a historian um, I think that there was a lot of political shenanigans going on from the Arius uh, bishops that followed Arius uh, and it was quite vicious so I think he doesn't pull that out here when he's talking about Arius um, and it again it comes down to perspective which side of the fence are you on in the history of this history are you on the side of Athanasius are you on the side of our areas uh, if you say you're looking at it objectively then um, there can be uh, good and bad on both sides I suppose but I think that from what I know of the text is what the 
the Arians did to Athanasius getting him to be exiled three times or is it four times shows you the kind of underhanded stuff that they were getting up to um, so for me uh, I think this is a too simplistic reading of Nicaea uh, and the life of Arius okay thank you